So the next section of my talk is methods of data collection in African cultural astronomy. We'll start with archival historical methods. Our sources are colonial archives, Islamic libraries, travel writings, and ethnographies. Pretty much anything that you can find in print. And the method <clears throat> is to go to these archives and these other printed materials and, and basically search for information about astronomy and the sky. There's currently uh, three major projects that are going on that are doing this. One is um, Keith Snedegar is going through the South African archives and finding out about Bushman cosmology and astronomy and Swana, um, all the South African ethnic groups. He's searching for that knowledge that was recorded over the last 150 years in South Africa in the archives. Then we have the study of the Timbuktu libraries, and we're going to hear Tebe Mendupe speak on that uh, sometime in the next four days. So I won't go into much detail about that. And then we have the Dogon materials, which we're going to have um, one speaker tomorrow speak on the Dogon materials. So what can be learned? Well, all sorts of things are in those archives, but you're really limited. There's a caution there. You're limited by who was doing the recording and what they were interested in. So archaeoastronomy. <clears throat> The data sources are archaeological sites, buildings, villages, natural and modified observing sites. Natural and modified observing sites would be uh, a place where you have a village down in a valley. On one side of the valley, you have an artificially made platform where you have whoever is the village astronomer up there and they do observations of the sun's movement on a nearby ridge and perhaps over time the people have made a notch in that ridge so that when the sun sets on that notch it's some special date like it's the end of summer or the middle of winter so that's a natural and modified observing site so the methods are you do you go out there with you know what is it, transom, and you do like an archeological dig and you record alignments. And then you search for a correlation between the alignments that you find and celestial bodies rising and setting on the horizon. So the first works done in this area of archeoastronomy in Africa were of course with the Egyptian pyramids and figuring out what they were aligned to and they found they were aligned to Sirius and you know, things like that. So what can we learn from this? You can identify uh, culturally significant celestial bodies, okay? You find 10 houses all aligned to the same star rising. That means that star probably is significant to the culture. Then you get to theorize of why it's significant to that particular culture. And also, these alignments are used for dating of sites. So you reverse the problem. You know that, for example, a particular star is important to a culture and that they have always aligned their buildings to a particular star. And then when you find that the, the buildings are no longer aligned to that star, but you know in the past they have been, and therefore you can precess the sky backwards to when that alignment is valid and that gives you the dating of the building. Another um, method is to look at dictionaries and lexicons. And these are basically just collections of terms. So you go through these dictionaries, these old dictionaries that were you know, made 100 years ago, and you just search for celestial terms. The first paper that I found in print was 1912 um, by Alice Warner. And here it is, note on Bantu star names. So this is the first page. Of it's, it's only a couple of pages long. So what can you learn? You'll, know, you'll learn what celestial bodies have been observed in various ethnic groups. And you can compare these terms to nearby ethnic groups' terms to see if there's some sort of linkages of celestial terminology. 
And also, if it's a really good person who compiled the dictionary, they'll have just the term and the legend behind the term right there in the dictionary. But again, you're limited by what the person who was doing the recording knew about the sky. So one thing that I've found is that when I go through dictionaries, et cetera, uh, compiled in Africa, there's almost no mention of the planets, none. So my assumption is that whoever was doing the recording didn't know the difference between a planet and a star very well. So, because if you're a sky watcher, you can tell the difference between a planet and a star. So I think it is a limitation of the people who are mostly missionaries, right, because they were creating these to convert uh, the Bible into the native language, right? So that was their goal, a lot of them. And they weren't astronomers. The last method is anthropology, ethnography. So the source of information is the people of Africa today. And you go out and you interview them and you do surveys. Participant observation means you, you basically do what they do and you do recordings and interviews and that's how you collect your data. The first paper of this type was uh, 1899 that I found for Africa. So what can you learn? This, this list is not complete. So there's much more you can learn than the list that's popping up. But to start with, how astronomy knowledge is intertwined or entwined with culture. The significance of celestial bodies within African cultures. Myths, legends, socio-political aspects and socio-economic aspects of sky knowledge agricultural and environmental adaptation aspects of sky knowledge. This is the, the slide on Marcel Grial, because even though research has been done for almost 200 years on African astronomy and culture, it really came of age with the work of Marcel Grial towards the center of the century. And he worked, he's from Paris, right? And he worked among the Dogon of Mali. And his works, his two major works were published after his death. And those are these two here, Le Renard Pal and Conversations with Olga Tamali. So there's a lot of controversy <clears throat> surrounding his work. But the first controversy among anthropologists was the method of data collection. Because he had been working among the Dogon for a long period of time. And finally, the elder said, okay, we're gonna give you this guy who's gonna teach you about the metaphysical aspects of Dogon uh, religion and cosmology. And so every day for something like 40 days, he would invite all the anthropologists that were in the village into like a classroom, and then he would lecture to them. And this is not the way you gather information in anthropology. So that was a big controversial thing. But the information is there. So he, influenced several people who later worked in African astronomy and culture. Most of these people are anthropologists and art historians and, and all of these people work in Mali. And what you have here is your emergence of your first African person working on cultural astronomy issues and that's Yusuf Sese. So currently what's happening with the Dogon materials our other researchers are critiquing his work, reanalyzing, and trying to reproduce his work. So this, his work was done, you know, 1940s, and there's still, it's so controversial that this will not die. 